Good afternoon, everyone. I am Chloe Northrup, and I am on the Northeast campus, and I am a professor of history. Today is our third in our series, Protests in American History. And today, our focus is going to be on protests in, in Native American history, protests by veterans, and I'm really excited that you will all be here. Our first talk today is going to be about social movements. And our presenter, our first presenter today is Dr. Anthony Soto McGrath. And his title is American Protests, Social Movements and the Importance that They Play in Social Life. Anthony Soto McGrath is an adjunct sociology instructor with TCC Connect. He has about 15 years teaching experience, both in person and online. And he has been with TCC since 2015. In addition to teaching, he also works as a social scientist for the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, Office of the Secretary, leading various research teams and helping agency translate science into policy. But before he speaks, I want to make one more announcement. If you have any questions, please put them in the live event Q&A and they'll be answered at the end. So if you just heard me talk about Dr. Soto McGrath's other job, maybe that's something that interests you, put that in the chat as well. Also stay until the end for the link for your credit so that you can get credit for attending today. Thank you all for being here. We are so looking forward to our speakers today. And without any further ado, here is Dr. Anthony Soto McGrath. Good afternoon. So as we are talking about today and the importance that protests play, one of the key differences I wanted to sort of draw is between protests and social movements. They certainly overlap. Um, if a protest is part of a conscious, concerted, and sustained effort by an ordinary group of people to change some aspects of their society using non-institutional means, then it's a social movement. The key word of non-institutional means essentially means that these people are trying to resolve their grievances outside of the regular political process. So social movements use a variety of tools and techniques and protests uh, certainly includes one of them. So parents trying to change the PTA policy at their local school is not a, a social movement. The key words sort of to understand what social movements are and whether or not a protest can be considered part of a social movement is conscious, sustained, ordinary people, and again, non-institutional means. Social movements are, are more conscious and organized in fads and fashions. They last longer than a single protest or riot. There is more to them than formal organizations, although such organization typically plays a part. They are composed mainly of ordinary people as opposed to politicians or economic elites. They need not be explicitly political, but many are. They are protesting something either explicitly, like the anti-war movement, or implicitly, as in the back to the land movement that is disgusted with modern urban and social life. Some social movements have looked for opportunities to claim new rights, while others have responded to threats or perceived threats or violence. Some have sought political and economic uh, emancipation and gains, while others have fought lifestyle choices they liked or feared. Some have created formal organizations, while others uh, relied on informal networks. And still others have used more uh, spontaneous sort of actions, such as riots. Social movements have largely had to choose between violent and nonviolent activities, legal and legal ones, disruption in education, or extremism and moderation. Next slide. So now that we have a basic understanding of what a social movement is, what a protest is, and how they relate, the next sort of question for is why should we care? 
and we should care a lot because they play very important uh, uh, aspects into, in, into our social lives. Social movements, number one, are a window into a number of aspects of social life. They're the main source of political conflict and potential change. Social movements are often the first to articulate new ideas and issues. As people become attuned to some uh, special problem or social problem that they want to solve, they form some kind of movement and push for a solution. Political parties and their leaders rarely ask the most interesting questions or raise new issues. As bureaucracy sets in, uh, politicians uh, spend their time in their daily routines. And it's often the social movements who are outside of the political system that force the insiders to recognize and or acknowledge certain fears and desires. Number two, social movements tell us about human action and more generally social theory. Um, when we study them, we learn things such as why and how people do the things that they do, especially why they do it together. This is also a question that drives sociology in general, especially social theory. Social movements raise the famous Hobbesian problem of social order. Why do people cooperate with each other when they might get as many or maybe more benefits by acting selfishly or alone? So if we can see why people voluntarily cooperate in social movements, we can understand why they cooperate in, uh, more, more generally. Political action is a paradigm of social action that sheds light into other spheres of social life. So it gets at the heart of human motivation. For an example, do people act to maximize their material benefits? Do they act out of ritual that express their beliefs about the world or simply reaffirm their place in the world? Number three, social movements tell us a lot about social change, as we just alluded to. There's the theoretical component, which is, uh, again, the source of social change. Um, but you have to remember that there are other sources of social change as well. Um, formal organizations, especially corporations, could be a source of, of change. As corporations create new products to market, some of these may disrupt people's way of life. For an example, a new machine might displace workers, or perhaps a new plant is releasing toxic waste near a school. And people react to these changes and resist them by what? By forming social movements. But while organizations, formal organizations, are the main source of technological change, they rarely are the source of change in values and change in social arrangements. And why? Well, in modern societies with tightly knit political and economic systems, the big bureaucracies, and de they demand economic, political control and stability. So they try to uh, uh, make everything routine, routinize everything in order to prevent the unexpected. So innovations and values and political beliefs often arise from discussions through social movements. Why don't societies just endlessly reproduce themselves intact? Well, it's social movements that develop new ways of seeing society and new ways of, of directing it. They are the central part of what we call civilized society or the public sphere, where individuals and groups get to discuss their own futures. Practically speaking, uh, social movements are important to social life because if you have a practical interest in spreading democracy or freedom or in society changing, there are tons of tricks, techniques um, uh, in terms of organizing, mobilizing, influencing that you can learn. In other words, social movements don't just create themselves. They, they don't just happen. And so there have been a lot of social movements around for 40 plus years that we can uh, learn from. They've accumulated a lot of knowledge, uh, know-how about how to make movements uh, kind of be created and how to sustain movements. And so this is what scholars look at when they sort of study social movements. The moral basis of society. Well, social movements are a bit like art. Um, they are efforts to express the sensibilities that have not yet been well articulated in society. We all have moral sensibilities, right? Including unspoken intuitions, as well as principles and rules that guide our actions, or at least make us uneasy when they're violated. So in closing, 
Social movements play a crucial role in contemporary societies. We learn about the world uh, through, through them. They encourage us to figure out how we feel about government policy, social trends, new technologies. In some cases, they even inspire the invention of new technologies or ways in which, or ways of using old technologies in a new way. Most of all, they are the means by which uh, we work out our moral visions, transforming vague uh, institutions or abstract ideas um, into uh, political demands. Thank you. Thank you so much. Our next speaker today is Christopher Douglas, who is in the Northeast campus in the government department. And today he will be speaking on anti-war protests in Vietnam and Iraq. He has worked in higher education for the last 20 years. And currently he is an assistant professor of government at Tarrant County College's Northeast campus and has an office right next door to me. His research interests focuses on identity politics, social justice, international relations, and elections. So uh, very interesting, I'm sure, right now. In the past, he has held in positions in admissions, financial aid, and student success. For the last 10 years, he has been involved with mentoring faculty and students, providing college consulting services, and an advocate and champion for student issues in higher education. He received his MA in government from Temple University and a BA in government from Rowan University. So let us all give a round of applause for our next speaker, Christopher Douglas. Okay. Thank you, Chloe. Thank you, Chloe. Uh, I appreciate you and Misty asking me to participate in this um, event in light of recent events. I think a discussion such as this is of critical importance. The series that you're doing is definitely tied into the events that have been happening um, with protests that are happening. And my focus is on the anti-war protests, but I think they're definitely somehow related or there is connections that we can see between um, the protests that have taken place and the ones that are ongoing now. Uh, in general terms, uh, protests are they're really interwoven into the history of the United States. So without having some discussion or understanding about protests, it would be really hard for us to um, have a true sense about what we are as the United States. Um, so to be clear, I'm a fan of protests. Even if I disagree with the reason or the purpose of the protest, um, I still think that protests are an invaluable part of how our democracy works. Um, the reason or purpose to me is of critical importance, the why, if you will. Um, about why people protesting is of significant importance. Um, when an individual or group of people decides that they're going to go against the grain or swim against stream to protest, they're taking a lot of sacrifices. They're missing work. Um, they're stopping doing the things that they like to do. They're not playing Netflix or whatever it is they want to do. This purpose is um, more meaningful to them than any, anything else. Uh, so why would a person forego whatever it is that they enjoy to protest? Um, that question to me is another important consideration. Consideration, As you can see from the points that I have here, there's a couple of questions that I want to ask and highlight a couple of things about protests in particular that were related to the Vietnam conflict or war and the Iraqi war. But why are they protesting? What's the rationale, explanation, or some of the perceptions about why people are protesting? And whether or not protests can be considered effective. And depending on how you're measuring it, uh, there's a lot of ways that you can determine or make that determination about that success or not. And hopefully um, the information that you have about the Vietnam War and the Iraq War will be enhanced, but some of the protest is what we'll um, highlight in the, the few minutes that we have here. There we go. Um, so why are they protesting? There are um, plenty of reasons why people are engaged in protests. Most of the protests, uh, the passion that people have, uh, have been centered around or are centered around uh, civil rights or civil liberties, violations of someone's civil rights and civil liberties. In many cases, if we look back on our history, um, starting with the abolitionist 
uh, efforts to end slavery, the women's suffrage movement, moving up through the civil rights movement, uh, some of the things that Dr. Soto McGrath was just talking about, those social movements are characterized with those protests. Um, in addition to those protests, um, there's consideration about the use of military force and whether or not the United States as a nation is engaging in armed conflict. And the ability for us to negotiate or use diplomacy in a lot of people's minds are better option than going to war. That is absolutely a reason why you see some people protesting around the Vietnam, or you saw some people protesting around the Vietnam War and the Iraq War. Um, opposition to military force in general is some people's position, whether they're a pacifist or not, or someone that doesn't believe um, that violence should be resorted to by any means, is another group of individuals that are involved with the uh, anti-war protests. And Martin Luther King Jr. would fit into this category. He was obviously a civil rights activist, but also an anti-war protester against the Vietnam War. And much of the discussion, much of his teachings, much of his writings were centered around a nonviolence movement. So that makes sense that he would not necessarily be advocating for armed conflict. Um, another maybe smaller group, but one that um, might fit into my understanding is if they have loved ones or people um, who were enlisted in the armed services. And that's um, give you a little bit of insight into how, I, how who I am, is how my understanding, my thought process as it relates to protests for the military and also um, the military itself is shaped. I have a really, really big family. If we were to do a survey of everybody on this call, a survey of a group of people, none of y'all would have a family as big as mine. It's not even close. I would be surprised if you were. My dad is one of 14. My mom is one of 12. So I have first cousins like you wouldn't believe. Um, amongst all those folks, though, there are a lot of people who served in the military. My brother uh, was in the Army. He served in the 101st Airborne. I have an uncle who actually landed on Normandy during D-Day, a great uncle. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about him later. And I have several cousins and other uncles who participated um, in military, some of which are still engaged. Uh, right now, there's about a dozen family members of mine who are um, enlisted or serving uh, currently. And I wanted to bring up a couple of them because they're a little bit closer to my heart because they're my, they're kids of my brother and sister. On the left is Clayton. He is at, uh, an Air Forceman and he is in Japan, Misawa Air Force Base. To the right, the shorter guy is Nathaniel. He's an officer in the Marines. He just got back from Denmark and now he's stationed in North Carolina. And to the right of Nathaniel is Parker. He's my sister's youngest baby who's way bigger than me now, and he has just finished up his basic training. But the idea of my family's service absolutely has an impact on how I view the military. And um, one caveat or one point that I want to make is you can be against the war and support the troops. I obviously support my nephews, my cousins, my uncles, uh, but I may not want to necessarily see the United States engage in armed conflict if it's uh, not necessary. Um, one of the questions that I well, wanted us to talk about or think about at least is why are they protesting? A lot of times when discussions of protests um, develop and they have quite frequently over the past several months, um, the past several year, years actually, um, some of the questions that you hear are why are they kneeling for the anthem? Why are they disrespecting the troops? Why are, those why are they banging those drums? There's always drums at a good protest. The drums actually draw me in. I love the drums at any protest. I love the drums anywhere. But a lot of questions are asked about what is the rationale or why is um, this protest ongoing? Um, to me, the biggest question and the one that should be fundamental is what is the purpose? Why are these protesters, like I said, taking time out of their lives to let people know of their displeasure with whatever activity it is that they're protesting against? So I encourage all of us, myself all the time included, um, is to not necessarily focus on the method of the protest, but try and understand why people are protesting. What is it that folks are trying to prove? What is the ultimate message when a protest um, is being engaged in by groups or by individuals? Um, are protests effective? A question that I often pose uh, when we're discussing protests in the classes that I teach is, 
um, what is the efficacy of these efforts? And a lot of times there are people that think that protests are not effective at all. Um, and I think there's a, a measuring piece that is missing from that conversation. The expected results are critical to how you view the success or efficacy of a protest. In a lot of cases, you see some of the things that are listed here. Policy change is what is demanded or wanted by those protesters. Some type of direct action to have a person brought up on charges or person removed from office or something that wants to take place immediately. Um, and that too is a big challenge as it relates to protest. A lot of times the activity of a protest does not produce results, does not yield actionable items immediately. In a lot of cases, it takes a lot of time. Um, practices, societal norms, the differences that people may see, again, speaking to some of those social movement issues as well, and the democratic process are all viable options that people have about do we measure this protest as being successful? Can we tangibly see the things that have changed from the effects of these protests? In a lot of situations, uh, they're not immediate, as I said, and it takes a lot of time. One such example of a protest that took a lot of time for it to have um, long-term impact or some impact is the Bonus Army protest, which is a protest that took place um, in 1932, and it was centered around World War I veterans. So after World War I, the victory that was achieved, the United States government in 1924 promised to give the veterans of World War I a bonus. In 1929, we know that there was an economic collapse. There were people who were in dire financial straits and a protest developed around, amongst those people and they came to Washington and they wanted to have that bonus early. Well, the federal government wasn't willing to give them that bonus early. They camped out and as is the case with some protests, violence resulted in troops were brought in to try and quell the violence and there were some of the protesters, two in particular, that were killed um, but the desired change that they wanted to take place, um, the desire to have the troops respected, to be compensated, to have better consideration after their service, didn't materialize for them immediately. However, I think that this protest played a significant role in how the troops from World War II and subsequent troops might have been compensated, might have been treated. So the immediate impacts were not directly for those individuals to be realized but it was something that had a positive impact on soldiers in general and the folks that we look at today. Um, that takes us to the Vietnam um, War and some of the protests that were uh, against the war in Vietnam. And this was um, kind of the, the high life of protests. Keep in mind that the civil rights activists started in the 1950s and the 1960s, there were all kinds of protests happening trying to address um, civil rights and civil legislation um, and the anti-war protests that took place as well were kind of in line and you can see some of the images of the ideas, the messages, um, the thousands of folks that were engaged in the resistance to what the United States engaged in was engaged in in Vietnam. Uh, just for some background to have a, a better understanding about the Vietnam War, um, the time frame is there from 1961 to 1975 is when um, the United States had troops um, involved in Vietnam and by all measures in terms of the, the troops, the soldiers, the armament that was in place, it was a war but because it wasn't officially um, categorized as a war by the Congress, some people still refer to it as a conflict. But what was happening at the time was centered around the Cold War um, battle between the United States and the Soviet Union. It wasn't a real war, this Cold War it was an ideological struggle with democracy and communism on either side. And the North Vietnam communists were in conflict with the South Vietnam, who, who, the South Vietnamese, who were allies of the United States. Um, and obviously our troops were landing in the South to present that fight to the North. And how those troops were being selected, the length of time that they were involved with the conflict and how much information the American people saw were all issues um, for the protester of the Vietnam War protests. Um, this participation in a war was really conflicted and divided in the nation. It's, it's close to being a divided nation today, but it was extremely divided when we're talking about the lives of 18, 19, 20 year olds being sent um, 
to fight on behalf of the United States in a foreign land. A lot of these protests took place on college campuses. So people who are in similar positions to you um, or sitting in similar seats to what you were and actually probably on the South Campus and the Northeast Campus were engaged in some of these protests. So a lot of students, um, some former soldiers were heavily involved in the thousands of protests that were happening over the length of the war. And as I mentioned, that civil rights era protests were also adding um, expertise to the level of protest that we saw in terms of um, gathering enough folks to be present at a place, to have the messaging be clear. So all the things that are associated with those protests early on were kind of continued through the entire Vietnam War uh, protest that took place. Um, a big point of contention had to do with some of the makeup of the soldiers who were fighting in the war and also the treatment that individuals received after they returned from war. At certain points of the Vietnam conflict, 40% of the troops that were fighting on behalf of the United States were African American. And at that time in history, only 11% of the population was African American. So you can see there's a disproportion uh, number of African Americans and to a lesser degree Latinos who were uh, making up the forces that were fighting compared to the general population. In addition to the discrepancies with the makeup of the troops, how those troops were treated when they returned was also um, part of the fuel for the protests that existed as well. When troops returned, often they weren't granted the same opportunities as troops were in World War II. The U.S. Veteran Affairs and other services that were offered were not granted to the Vietnam War vets. And in some cases, they were told they were not fighting in a real war because the conflict that they were engaged in was not as on a grand scale as World War II, um, but that participation or their reception when they came back was definitely something um, that presented a lot of challenges to the perception that people had of the war itself, and especially by those soldiers who were coming back. Um, the treatment that soldiers get, the way that the GI Bill was given, and in some case those services were denied, presented challenges along with the treatment of particular individuals. Two examples that I wanna mention to kind of highlight or underscore are uh, the case of Isaac Water Jr. And I mentioned, um, I had an uncle who landed in Normandy. He's my uncle Junius. Um, when he returned from conflict, um, he was going his, on his way back to New York and actually was assaulted in uniform. Um, he was able to survive and not have a, a devastating impact, but it absolutely scarred his psyche and had an impact on how he viewed himself as a soldier, how he viewed the United States. Uh, and, a, and a lot more famous example is Isaac Woodard Jr., who was a decorated war veteran. And um, as he was returning to South Carolina, his home state after World War II, he got into a confrontation and was drugged from a public bus and beaten by a sheriff and lost sight in both of his eyes, still in uniform. So imagine this, you're coming back from a theater of war in Europe, you're riding the bus home. Um, and because of his request to go to the bathroom, which the bus was supposed to honor at that time, he got into a confrontation. The authorities were called, and he's a 26-year-old 26, 26 man, soldier, decorated war veteran, who lost sight in his eyes from that event and never regained his sight and lived a long life till he was uh, 73 years old. But that incident absolutely shaped um, how he perceived himself as a soldier, how that reception was when he got back for him and other soldiers as well. So some of these specific incidents are for sure um, anecdotal, but they definitely have some impact into the perception that people have um, when those folks return from various theaters of war. The most recent group of protests and one of the most significant protests um, in the history of the world actually is the anti-Iraq war protests. And this is something that um, I was very cognizant of because at the time it was happening, I had friends who were involved in the military, enlisted in the military. I was living in New York City. It was post 9-11. So the, the events surrounding the Iraq war protests were ones that were clear and near um, to where I was in my current station in life. You can see from this picture, the protests against the Iraq war were global in nature. So this is not something that was just specific to the United States. It was a global protest. So around the world, people were in opposition to the direction that the United States was moving 
in Iraq. And what they were doing and who they were is um, part of a challenge in why they were engaged in those activities are highlighted here. So the Iraq war began in March of 2003. It lasted until December of 2011. So that is near the beginning of George W. Bush's administration and extended through um, the first administration of Barack Obama. The crux of the conflict had to do with a few different things, but the removal of the dictator Saddam Hussein and the thought that there was weapons of mass destruction were two of those big pieces. We spent a trillion dollars um, during this time frame, a little bit less than a decade, and approximately 500,000 Iraqis, some reports have that number quite higher than that, um, and 4,800 of the United States and coalition soldiers died fighting in this Iraq war. And the protests, like those for Vietnam, were centered around college campuses to a lesser degree to former soldiers. Um, younger folks were outraged with that. Uh, but one of the biggest events that, that I want to highlight and make sure that you're aware of is the, the day that the world said no to war. This is um, the largest protest in the history of the world, according to Guinness Book of World Records and several other authorities. On this day, February 15th in 2003, there were 14 million people who came out to speak their, their voice, to have signed, to protest um, against this war. It occurred in 800 different cities around the world. So it was a pretty substantial um, protest that was happening. And as I mentioned, um, the post 9-11 environment in the United States because of the attacks that took place on American soil had those in the United States a little bit more willing to accept um, going into armed conflict. But as we go back in history and review those uh, over the reality that was in place, those protests um, were definitely asking the right questions. Um, bringing into the question of authority, like I said, is not a bad thing and something that should take place. And in this case, um, that largest protest in the world extended beyond our borders and went, went around the world. These protesters were not necessarily affected. If you remember the previous piece of information I shared with you, the war lasted from 2003 to 2011. Um, so these protesters weren't necessarily effective in stopping the war. But again, if you're looking to measure excess only by that direct action, you're limited. There definitely was some benefit and awareness that people were raised by this uh, protest that took place across so many countries and so many nations. Too fast. Um, to summarize, the, the idea that protests are effective is critical in my mind. And the biggest takeaway is uh, of trying to wrap your brain around it or understand the process, the, pro the protests that have taken place from our history to those that have just happened a few months ago is understanding the why. Um, opposition to authority is um, a fundamental part of our democratic process. We have the ability to question those who are um, governing us, who are making decisions about us, and protests are a major and important way to do that, especially when we're talking about sending troops in harm's way, as was the case with um, Vietnam and Iraq. All right, that's it for me. Thank you so much, Professor Douglas. Our last speaker today is Dr. Lisa Euler, who is going to be talking about Native American protests. And just as a little background on Native American Heritage Month, which we are currently in right now, according to the Library of Congress and their website, Native American Indian Heritage Month celebrates and recognizes the accomplishment of peoples who were the original inhabitants, explorers, and settlers of the United States. And it first had its origins in 1986, when Congress will set aside then a in American Indian Week. And this expanded then in 1987 from that to, um, to when Congress will make that a little bit more firm. And then in 1990, it, Congress will pass to make it Native American Indian Heritage Month. And since 2009, it's now been known as Native, National Native American Heritage Month. And so we are currently celebrating the 30th year of the 
National Native American Heritage Month, and we will be hearing today from Dr. Lisa Euler about Native American protests. She has a PhD in political theory, American government, and international relations. She has a master's in international affairs from George Washington University, and she specialized in international organizations and administration and international finance with a bachelor's in Russian studies. Her dissertation in written works on Nisha and his perception of the effects of democracy on women, Afro-Indian history and issues, indigenous issues, such as Native American boarding school experiences, Native women and treaty issues are some of her research interests. So welcome today to Lisa Euler, who will be presenting on Native American protests. Hi, can you guys all hear me? Because I only came in as an attendee, so I want to make sure everyone can hear me before we get started here. Yes, we can hear you, Dr. Euler. Okay, perfect. Um, I wanted to say thank you to both of the previous presenters. It was really interesting how I wish we could do these things sort of like live and interacting and talking with each other because I love so many of the things they bring out. Like um, uh, Professor Douglas talking about the drums and how all protests have drums. And it's going to be interesting as we pull into Native American um, protest history, why that might possibly be and how we're all sort of woven together in this sort of fabric of a protest in American history long before America even is America. And, um, and I love the theme that we have here today on why do we protest? And we often focus on when we're looking at why we protest on the issue like the Dakota pipeline or uh, Vietnam or et cetera. But there's, I think from my perspective, a, a, a underlying layer in a democracy, which Tokyo talks about called the tyranny of the majority. That when you have a system, a democracy where everyone is free to vote, but if, we have 10 people and seven of them always think the same and always vote, the dominant group always wins. The majority always wins in a democratic society. So how do the disaffected minority groups, whether they're ethnic minorities or they're gender minorities, whether they're issue minorities like the environment, how do they get power in a system where they're never going to get the vote in Congress? They're never going to be the dominant um, entity in numbers. So does that relegate them to always having no power? That's why he calls it tyranny of the majority. And it's a, it's a risk we take in a democracy. So protesting is a way for those groups to either get out their, their issue, draw attention to something like the Dakota Pipeline uh, protest, or it actually can be used as an alternative road to power. And what I mean by alternative road to power is through civil disobedience, we break the law, we break the rule in order to get arrested. The purpose or goal is actually to be arrested. So that way you can have what is called standing in our system, like Rosa Parks. You break the rule, you, um, you fight against the system. When you are arrested, you now have been damaged by the law. So if we have a law that is, um, we feel unconstitutional or it hurts our civil rights or the environment, et cetera, just because I don't like the law or I think the law is bad or unfair, I have no recourse in the judicial system to change it until I have been damaged by it. So I break the law, I'm arrested, now I have what's called standing and I can try to change the system from within. And this is a way that disaffected groups have often had to try to take this road because they're never gonna get the majority in Congress. So they try alternative streets, alternative methods to get to this place. Now, the problem with using the judicial system in cases like Brown versus the Board of Education, et cetera, is that it's slow. It's not an overnight process. It can take four to eight years to get through the federal court system. Longer if it goes all the way to the Supreme Court. It's costly, which is why often like the NAACP or LULAC has to get involved to help support these people who've been damaged to pay for their attorney fees, et cetera. Um, but those are all sort of the underlying reasons why people might in a democratic system protest to change within the system if they cannot work through the normal methods. Um, but for my group, for indigenous people, um, it's slightly different. We're often called the invisible majority, I mean minority, excuse me, because we are that, we're invisible. Um, we are less than 1% of the population, you don't hear about us, and there are a lot of reasons why you don't. Um, and 
we'll get to that in just a little bit about why Native Americans historically have been invisible to the to the, his, the history world, even in the textbooks. Um, but we are um, historically, you might have heard that we're a oral people that we tell stories, and many people think that means we just like to tell stories, like authors. Um, but it's actually much deeper than that. It's often misunderstood by Western culture. It doesn't mean that um, we just like to tell what happened to us and we like to sort of be from the eye perspective. Um, because once we developed a written language before the Revolutionary War, if we were just oral because we didn't have a language, it would have changed at that perspective. At that time when we developed a written language, our vision, our culture, our religion of being storytellers would have also changed too. Um, but for us, telling stories is the way that we connect, the way we learn, the way we express ourselves through connection. And the easiest way for me to explain this to students, I tell them all the time, is that Native Americans would not try to find out how an eagle flies by taking it apart, by weighing the bones, seeing how buoyant they are, by measuring the wingspan. We wouldn't gather all this sort of Western scientific data to try to explain it. What we would do is observe the eagle for centuries, pass down our observations, we would try to imagine how does it feel to fly, you know, a mile above and, you know, on the winds and how would it seem to, um, how, to have that perception of being able to see, a, you know, a mouse on the ground from a mile away and can gather all that information and then use that information to get us to that point. All right, I'm keep getting a notification from Teams. Am I turned off or am I still going? <laughs> uh, anyway. So um, the point is that when we're thinking about the way in which Native Americans express themselves, it's through story, through connecting in our history. And I think it's one of the problems today is that we're losing our ability to connect through stories. We are trying to tell one or two main points looking at you know, the wingspan rather than telling the story of the eagle. And the same thing with protests and the same thing with minority groups. Um, Rhett Jones, who's a professor of uh, African American history at Brown University, stated that minority history is often relegated to what he calls the little blue box uh, in the margin. So the story, the main story of U.S. history is in the content, and then in these little tiny blue boxes in the margin, you would have African American history or Native American history. And in the over 100 college uh, history books that he looked at, even in African American history textbooks, the story of Afro-Indians or Native Americans was completely non-existent. There wasn't a single little blue box. So given this context of why we protest and how important it is to tell the stories from the Native perspective, um, I really want to talk about the specifics of Indigenous um, historical protests. And now when we think today of protests, we often think about Portland or mass marches where there are large numbers of people taking to the streets. Right? But as we talk about in my class, um, historically, different groups had sort of different flavors in their protests, based on a lot of different factors. Everything from what they were trying to attain to where they were located can affect the nature and style of a protest. For example, African Americans that conglomerated in large urban populations um, pre-Civil War to kind of hide in the masses um, to not be repatriated into slavery, um, during the civil rights era under MLK, they were in large urban mass march areas which is unlike the Hispanic civil rights movement um, under Cesar Chavez, where you have migrant farm workers who are, you know, a few here on this farm, hundreds of miles away from the other um, few, and they were often illegals and they, they migrated. He had a really hard time mobilizing them into large mass population in rural areas. So instead what he did is he looked outside the direct group um, through the use of boycotts of the mass population against the grape growers that he was targeting. Um, Native American population is even today extremely remote and isolated. Right? And historically, we're called the Stoic Indians because we don't like to talk about our problems. We don't like to tell people what we are experiencing and what we're going through. In fact, years ago, they always asked me um, to speak Native American Heritage Month. Um, I'm actually two or three times a, a week I'm giving some sort of speech on Native American Heritage Month. And it's very difficult for me. The first year or two, I actually stood up there and said, hey, I don't like talk about these things. We don't share this information. It isn't something that I want to put out there that, you know, my minority group, my people are the least educated. We have the 80% high school dropout rate. We have the highest um, infant mortality rate. We have a 
triple the national average poverty rate. We have a 10 year less than the national average lifespan. And the one in two Native American women will be domestically abused or violated or raped. And so when you start listing all these facts about your people, it literally, eight of it is so huge and we don't share those things. And we also have 535 registered tribes. Each has a different treaty obligation, languages, religion. We often were historically in conflict with each other and not just with the dominant um, uh, group, with the Caucasians. But Native American uh, protests prior to the Indian Bill of Rights in 1968 were largely individual or tribal, um, but systemic to the very culture and nature and the belief of my people. Our actions against the power and domination of colonialization um, started as early as the very first contact. Um, we learned last week in one of Professor Northrup's events about the myth of Thanksgiving, that the first period of contact to the late 1800s um, was not in fact the peaceful Thanksgiving, which um, you know, is taught in our history books. But in fact, in Native American perspective, we have three different periods in US history in contact with Western civilization. And the first during this period up to the 1800s is called the annihilation period. And where the interaction with indigenous peoples was characterized by the saying, the only good Indian is a dead Indian. Um, in this time period, it's almost entirely the interaction is violent. Um, in 1622, local indigenous Gengaskin Indians um, killed the, all of the white settlers as their ship arrived onto the shores in the 1622. Um, they freed all of the slaves that had been brought with them and incorporated them into their population. And I always find these statistics interesting and facts when I find them in my research, because nowhere do I remember in history class growing up and going to a Western school where we talked about the earliest religious settlers who were escaping persecution and coming to the new world to be free, but they brought slaves with them as early as 1622. We always associate that with like Southern antebellum, you know, the slave trade, um, not with as early as 1622. Um, but there are multiple reports in a uh, research paper I'm working on now about how, for example, the Spanish particularly um, tried to enslave the local population as well, um, but they were unsuccessful. And here's a quote. Um, once they were chained, they refused to eat or even move and slowly wilted to death, longing through their bars for, uh, for freedom from their cages. Um, they basically ran hunger strikes. So from the early as the 1600s, they were fighting against um, the settlers who were landing. They were fighting for their freedom. In 1726, the governor of New York forcefully um, got the Iroquois, the Huron, and the Delaware to sign um, a treaty saying that they would return all runaway slaves who had been escaping to these tribes, um, and even through extensive economic and physical pressure by the government, not a single former runaway slave who, who escaped to the Iroquois here on a Delaware was ever returned. So even in the face of economic pressure and physical pressure, um, they're not re or, you know, relenting to the government. These are forms of protest just as much as walking down Main Street. Um, Pre-revolutionary and Civil War history is rife with documentation of the savage and disobedient Redskins who did not know enough to, of civilization to follow orders. And most of these rebellions, um, I, like I said, were violent. They were surrounded by land grabs and white settlers demanding that uh, Native Americans turn, away, uh, turn over runaways. Um, but this all changes in the 1800s. And this is what I really wanted to focus on just a little bit today is the Dawes Act. Um, and the reason I wanted to is, uh, talk about the boarding schools is this is the young people protesting. Because in the Dawes Act in the 1880s, with the end of the Civil War, the U.S. government turn, turns to solving the Indian problem. And this is the second phase, which is known as the assimilation period, which is characterized by the saying, kill the Indian, save the man. So the Dawes Act was this multiple pronged attack on Indian culture, heritage, and their land. Um, the first was a reorganization of the community nature. So instead of having all of the reservation land held in, in community where each one of us has the responsibility to the community and we're all sort of united in the preservation of the land and the use of the land, they wanted to separate it out into individual plots um, in the I own this land, this is my farm, sort of Western property type of a way. And every male over the age of 18 um, was given 20 to 100 acres of the land. Um, the lots were chosen by the Bureau of Indian Affairs. So let's say if we had like a thousand acres of land and we have to give um, 10 men uh, their 100 acres. And the Bureau of Indian Affairs would pick which parts of land would go to which people. Huh? And any that was not used or needed. So let's say if we only need a thousand acres and the reservation owned 10,000, so the other 9,000 was returned to the US government in a land grab, which is the second part of the Dawes Act, and then sold. 
Over 156 million acres of land was confiscated under the Dawes Act. Texas is 167 million. So it's like basically the size of Texas. And that land was sold to white settlers who of course got to pick the land they wanted. And that money was held by the US government. So it didn't go to the native peoples. The US government held it in a fiduciary responsibility, like kind of like social security or a 401k to pay for Native American healthcare and Native American education in perpetuity. So when they talk about Native Americans getting like free stuff, we don't. It comes from the sale of our own land that the government then held and then it's sort of dishing out to us over time. Um, and the third, the most important part I want to talk about today about the Dawes Act is the boarding school. And so the boarding schools was they knew they could not break Native culture and traditions in the adults because they were already, you know, socialized, et cetera. But they could do it in the children. So I mean, I do a whole series on this. It usually takes me hours and hours to get through it all. But so really closely from 1880 to 1960, um, for six generations, the children of Native Americans were rounded up by um, Indian agents and taken to boarding school. Now, this is not boarding school like you think of with like the private school kids and their little uniform. Um, the boarding school, um, you would go when you were between the ages of like four and seven, depending on when they could catch you. And um, you would stay 10 to 12 years without returning home. You did not go home in summers, breaks, et cetera. And so by the time you did return home, if you returned home, you didn't speak your language, you didn't know your culture, et cetera. It was rife with rampant disease, trachoma, tuberculosis. Um, even though we know by the late 1800s, these are transmitted diseases, kind of like COVID. Um, in 1928 Miriam report, they argued that in all the schools that they visited, and they visited all but two boarding schools in America, they found only one towel per school, no soap, people with open sores working in the kitchens. They were sleeping three to four to a bed. The starvation was rampant. Although at the time, 35 cents per day was needed for daily nutrition, they were spending about 11 cents a day for each Native American child. And they actually have a list, and I always read this because it kind of strikes home the stories of what these children were suffering. Their daily menu consisted of three tablespoons of porridge, which is like oatmeal, um, two slices of bread, a half a cup of tea, and two tablespoons of lard. You know, like lard, like Crisco, you, they would get two tablespoons of lard. And that was their daily meal. They uh, were subject to hard physical labor for about five hours a day. They were working basically on farms to produce food for the school, which then would sell them to local settlers to pay for their own education. And this was at a time in the 1800s and the early 1900s when they could have been used at home during the Great Depression, et cetera, to work on their own homes. Um, and just to put a personal side on this, like, uh, uh, Christopher did earlier about his own family. Um, one of my cousins wrote home from school, we are always hungry. We are treated like pigs. Some of the boys hunt cats to eat. Everyone cries from hunger. Um, over 10,000 young girls were involuntarily sterilized um, at Native American boarding school. They had outing programs where the students were sent to work on their holidays so they didn't go home. They were sent to work in local white houses where they faced severe um, prejudice, et cetera. And the money that they earned from working in these homes was given to the school to pay for their education. Many of the youngest children um, were in what was called an adopt-out program, where for $10 you can adopt a, um, a Native child. Usually they were under the age of six, often you know, orphans or people that had um, only cousins or people at home in their reservation to not fight for them. So the children just disappeared. Um, but I could tell you stories for hours <laughs> and hours about the horrors of the boarding school. But I will tell you one personal one, and then we can talk about how the children protested against these at the school. So my father, who um, is Ojibwe, um, he was sent to Flandra, which is one of the worst we know now boarding schools. And he said he went about the age of five. And he remembers it had been about a year or two since he had been there. So he'd be between six and seven. And he joked about the fact that he had a hard time learning English. Um, and, you know, they were the punishments for speaking Ojibwe were ex escalated each time that you sort of got in trouble for it. And they started first with like physical ones. One time he got um, held up by his, uh, by his thumb um, in the room and, and whipped. But one time they finally, um, they threw him in a, in a cellar, like a root cellar. And he thinks they forgot him because he was there for several days and it rained. And this is the Dakota, so it's cold. It rained and the water filled up to about his chest. And he thought he was going to drown. But he had been there long enough to not have food and they forgot to feed him for several days. And he started eating the bugs that were floating on the top of the water. Now, this is devastating at a time when children should be loved and nurtured by their parents. They're taken from their parents. And not only did they suffer through the abuse of the school, 
but they also lose that connection of my parents should be defending me and taking care of me, and they're not here. So we have these generation after generation of disconnect. So how do we protest these things as children? Um, well, the boys, they ran away. <laughs> they often tried to, which uh, resulted in the boarding schools separating. So instead of all the Ojibwe going to one school or the Cherokee going to one school, they would take two or three and send them to Oklahoma or the Dakotas or Pennsylvania. And so you have multiple tribes represented at one school, and they were so far away um, that they often uh, uh, couldn't make it home. They didn't have the money to, and many of them died in route, so we don't really know what happened to them. Um, the boys also snuck out. They broke the rules. They went hunting to try to get food for the younger siblings. The girls, we were really inventive. <laughs> we burned down the dormitory. <laughs> we started fires. Yay! Um, and we formed secret societies. Um, and in these secret societies, we taught each other our languages. And it created, in, a, in one positive outcome of the boarding schools, it created a united Indian identity, which later then, instead of being you know, I'm Ojibwe, or I'm Cherokee, or I'm Comanche, or I'm Apache. We became, you know, the American Indian movement, the AIM. Um, and it led to this sort of conglomeration of the Indian identity. Um, and finally, we did a lot of um, passive resistance by refusing orders. Not outright refusing, because that would lead to violence or, or punishment, but pretending we didn't understand. Separating ourselves from what's happening, not responding. The parents, how the parents protested these, is as the death rates climbed, as children never returned, and when they did return, they couldn't speak to their own parents. Um, they had changed their names, etc. They began to teach the youngest children um, hide and seek games. My dad remembers this um, a lot. That they would teach them when the agents would come onto the reservation, an alarm would go up, and all the children would run and hide in the spot that their parents had showed them to hide. Sometimes it would be hours, sometimes days. My my um, my uncle remembers at least a week one time that he had to hide until the agents left when they would come to round up the children. So they're taught that children is this bad, horrible place. I mean, excuse me, that school is this bad, horrible place to go. Um, and they were would play these hide and seek games. The Hopi Indians, who become sort of the 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 focal point for our protest against the the boarding schools, they refused to send their children. And so they signed a treaty conceding land, extensive amounts of land in Arizona, to avoid sending their children to school. But the U.S. government, of course, reneged on this treaty and came for their children. So the 19 Hopi leaders, the, ma the male leaders of the tribe, um, refused. And they were arrested and sentenced to Alcatraz, Alcatraz prison, where most of them died in Alcatraz prison for refusing to send their children. Now, what do all these protests from the 1800s to the 1960s, um, an individual children's protest and their parents, why, why do we care? Well, if you think about six generations of children who are instilled with this individual and then eventually joined identity of the American Indian movement, these values are inbred into who we are. They're a key for understanding um, our statistics of why we have an 80% high school dropout rate. They're, they're a total reflection of the identity of who we are and what we face today. Um, and this all culminates for, for all you history buffs. I'm not really good with dates. In fact, I have put like <laughs> my anniversary on the inside of my wedding ring or I forget it because I see time circular, not linear in the Western way. Um, anyways, it culminates in the Second Battle of Wounded Knee um, under the American Indian Movement um, in February of 1973, where the Ogallala, Ogallala Lakota, um, who are the ones protesting also against the Dakota Pipeline, um, they take over the Bureau of Indian Affairs office on the Pine Ridge Reservation in the Dakotas. And it all comes down to whenever we talk about this in my class, it's really hard to explain um, Native American history because there's so little context for most people. Um, and even we have to backtrack to like how reservation justice works. Native American reservations, we don't have control over crimes that are committed on reservations, the state doesn't, the local government doesn't, it's the FBI. So when, for example, if you guys have ever seen um, the, show, the, the one with the teacher, Breaking Bad, who um, they always have all of the RVs like out where he's making meth out in the desert, that's because we're on Indian land. And if a non-tribal member commits a crime on a reservation, we have no jurisdiction over it. All we can do at the most is collect them, take them to the nearest FBI, and then the FBI has to prosecute. But the FBI has 
way bigger things that they care about or they're working on to try to do than handle one domestic dispute or um, to handle, you know, a meth dealer who's got a mobile RV they can't find on the Arizona desert. So what ends up happening is the majority of these people do not get prosecuted. And because of that, the criminal element, thank you, Breaking Bad, um, has become aware of this fact and they've moved on to reservations and the crime rates are like astronomical. Um, and a lot of this has to do with the Native Americans not having control of their own um, population, control of their own, the crime that happens on their reservation, control of it. And so AIM, the American Indian Movement, has tried to gain more and more control over their own destiny. Um, rather than having the Bureau of Indian Affairs, which was the only uh, government agent exempt, agency exempt from the Pendleton Act, um, to be able to control um, what's happening and to eliminate some of the fraud. It results in um, over a thousand FBI agents surround them with five helicopters, two Native Americans are killed, and one um, non-Native, Ray Robinson, who's a civil rights activist, um, he disappears. They assume he's murdered, um, but he was gone. Um, so to, to, just in closing, um, the stories that we tell and the history of peoples, whether they're African American, Hispanic American, whether it's gender identity, whether it's the environmental groups, we, the context that we have in how we develop as a people and what things we protest and why is such a part of the communal story that it just saying this happened on this day at this time or seeing a picture of it or a statue of it, at least it starts us talking, but we have to dig deeper. And that's what I hope that things like what Chloe's been organizing, I'm so proud of what you're doing and it's so amazing. Um, that I hope students more and more participate and attend these things to get the bigger picture of what our history is and how we're all tied together. And that's it. Thank you so much, Dr. Euler. That was absolutely fascinating. We are going to be moving now into our Q&A session. And our first question is for Dr. Soto McGrath. And it is from Ben Schubert. And it says, I've seen some discussions of the anti-lockdown protests in comparison to the lockdown, uh, to the protests discussed today. How do anti-lockdown protests fit in to our understanding of the role and importance of protest against racial injustice and war? Do protests also represent a healthy expression of democratic principles, even if one disagrees with their belief and goals? Got to unmute. Sorry about that. I think there was some uh, technological or technology issues. Um, so um, I think with any social movement, um, like or I should say looking at a protest or protests, I think one of the things we want to think about is putting it in context. Um, and so I think the question less is whether it's good or bad and more about um, what, as, as um, Professor Douglas was saying, why is this happening? What are the grievances? Um, why would someone, for an example, want to protest a lockdown? Um, why, why, does, why does a particular group of people think that animals have rights? Um, so from a sociological perspective, it's trying to understand what the, the grievances are um, and trying to then sort of uh, gain insight into our social world about those grievances. Um, so I think that's kind of, I think the main point I would want, want to, to sort of make. Obviously within a democracy, as we've been talking about today, uh, social movements and protests play a very important role because they are typically the source of which social change sort of happens. Um, particularly outside of the, the normal political process. Change can happen within the normal political process. Protests uh, that are associated with social movements or protests in general are not the only source of social change, um, but, um, but looking outside of the political process is one way for us to, to understand that. 
Thank you so much for that. The next questions, and there, there's two, so I'll kind of say A and B for um, Professor Douglas. Why do we not see as many anti-war protests now? And is kneeling for the anthem anti-patriotic? So the next questions are for um, Professor Douglas, and you can answer either both and however you'd like. All right, so I'll take the first one first. Um, I think that the the type of conflict that was taking place definitely has some impact on the type of protest that you see. The wars that we fight today are brutal, to be sure, but there's not as much um, there's not as many casualties. There's not as much loss of life. If you look at the progression of war and the way in which war was has fought, it, it was a lot more gratuitous in the past is why we saw so many casualties in the Revolutionary War and Civil War. And the Vietnam War was a guerrilla warfare where the style of war resulted in a, a quite a few casualties as well. Today, the level of armed conflict has decreased because the troops that we've um, deployed in Afghanistan, Iraq, and other theaters of war are not as high as they were. And in 2003, when we were starting to engage in that Iraq war, there was a huge buildup of troops and resources that were devoted to war. So I think that's one of the reasons why you don't see as much. Um, in terms of the second question, the anthem, um, patriotism is, has a lot of definitions that people um, kind of are a, a little bit loose with. Protest in and of itself, to answer the second part of the previous question, if, if I could, the prote protest is a part of democracy, and kneeling for the anthem is a part of democracy. The U.S. flag code says that we can't make clothes with the flag on it or wear hats with the flag on it, but people violate that all the time. Um, in a lot of our closets, we have those things that are in direct opposition with what the flag code says. The idea of um, kneeling for the anthem, again, goes back to the question that I was addressing earlier. Why are these folks kneeling for the anthem? What is the purpose? And if you look at or juxtapose two stories of people who came back from war and how they were treated, you can see how there can be a little bit of difficulty in reconciling how the fundamental um, ideas of our nation are founded upon. Um, earlier this year, Drew Brees, the quarterback for the New Orleans Saints, got in a little bit of hot water because he talked about the treatment that his grandfather got back when he got back from World War II and how that made him support the flag and that he thought it was um, preposterous that people were kneeling for the flag. If you contrast that with the story of Isaac Woodard, um, you can see why his family might not be so patriotic because here's a man that sacrificed himself, was wounded, decorated battle veteran, and came back and did not receive any type of welcome, let alone a hero's welcome. So um, I'll stop there because I could go on forever, but I hope that answers your question. Thank you so much. Our next question is for Dr. Euler, and you mentioned how the Indian boarding schools, I guess, inadvertently had the effect of bringing different tribes together in some ways. And I was kind of, um, students were wondering in here, did tribes continue to protest as groups or did it kind of go back to tribal as individual protests? when we saw the ones you were mentioning from the 1960s and 70s? Actually, a little bit of both. Um, we now have an Indian Congress, which represents all tribes in Washington, D.C., so that was another result of this sort of um, Indian identity versus tribal identity, but we also still have a lot of um, rejuvenation of trying to teach our languages and our culture and our traditions to the children because there, so many of them were lost. So at the same time that we are, um, there's a, a retro movement for tribal identity and tribal protest, there's also still this um, conglomeration and kind of an understanding and a realization um, that in order to be effective, we need numbers. And as tribes, we have very small numbers, but as a group identity, um, we have a louder voice. And in many ways, that's kind of what protest is, is getting these little little pe individuals and people together to, to make their voice resonate larger with the, um, with the dominant group. And so we kind of have a little bit of both happening. 
it also depends on the individual um, issue that they're processing. Like the Dakota Pipeline is very specific to the Pine Ridge Reservation because that's where it's located. The Nestle water protests there in California, some of the reservations there. And um, so if there's an issue specific to that reservation or that tribe, often it tends to be tribal. Um, but we are represented now by an Indian Congress in Washington, and we do often, we get together at like the NCOR conference and we have, you know, tribal um, versus um, Indian questions that we try to put forth even to academics at places like NCOR. Thank you so much for that. Um, the last question is actually going to go to each of our speakers today and we'll go in order. And the question from the student is, how has social media changed doing these moments or doing these movements? How has social media really affected protests now? And so we will start with Dr. Soto McGrath and then Professor Douglas and then Dr. Euler. So I think there's, uh, that's a great question. They all have been great questions, by the way. Um, I think that's a, a very pretty big question in many respects, and that could be answered in a number of different ways. I think one of the ways in which uh, social media has affected uh, social movements and protests is um, that it is it is much more sort of, for lack of a better word, convenient or easier to uh, to sort of you know like something, not like something, make sort of a comment, um, and which is very different historically in terms of um, how people sort of decided to come together, how they decided to, to organize the various tactics, the sit-ins, the rallies, et cetera, where uh, um, there was something that was much more visible. Um, the, the usual sort of uh, tactics um, are not there. And so I think there are questions about, is it as valuable for a particular group to uh, essentially take their grievances online as it is um, to to what we've done in the past, to what those groups have done in the past. Um, how does that change their their message? Um, we talked a little bit about being affected or their outcomes. Um, I think those are things that scholars are still sort of learning and they're they're still studying. I don't don't think that it's sort of a simple yay or nay sort of answer. Um, but that's one I think question that comes to mind based on the the question that that, that we received. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna be squarely on the fence as well. I think it has been good and it has been bad. In some cases, it's created a much lower threshold for people's activism, and that may allow people to check the box to say that they're accomplished when they actually haven't done anything other than post a black square on their Instagram, and that in and of itself is a movement, but it's a very small movement. But if you look at uh, not too far history, the Arab Spring, which was an uprising that took place in 2012, it was almost totally driven by social media and the ability to connect people and to direct people and to have um, protests be done in a more um, exact way and intentional way has definitely been a benefit of social media and it's added to the connectivity as well. So both good and bad is what I would say. Interestingly enough, I'm going to go right on the fence with everybody on this one too, but for two different reasons. The first one, um, when I was in grad school, I did uh, 110 um, con congressmen. I interviewed them and wrote papers um, on log rolling. And I remember one of the questions that I added at the end was, do they keep record of how they're contacted by their constituents, whether it's by letter or by phone? You know, at the time, email was just sort of starting. And they actually said they not only keep contact, uh, keep information on whether their constituents want them to say yes or no on an issue or whatever, but how they do it. And I asked, well, why do you keep a record of whether they email you or letter you or call you? And he said, well, the, the amount of commitment it takes to sit down and write a letter and put a stamp on it and post it is much deeper than the amount of commitment it takes to forward a you know mass email that everybody is using and everyone's doing it's two seconds of click. And so not only do the people in power who make the laws, et cetera, look at whether we want yes or no for something, they also look at how much we want it. And social media is, like they said earlier, the, um, Dr. McGrath and, and Dr. Douglas, that it literally doesn't take 
a lot of commitment. And so how much do we really have to pay attention to what you're saying? Right? So for that aspect, I agree with, with, um, with Christopher that it really doesn't have a high threshold, a uh, real high level of involvement. Are you really achieving anything? But from the native perspective, because we are so isolated and the poverty is so high where we are at, like both of my parents, and Christopher, I'm gonna have to take you up on the side. My dad has 12 brothers and sisters and my dad ha and my mom has 11. And one of my mom's sisters has 15 kids. So we're gonna have to have chat about our cousin, but they both grew up in houses without houses. They don't have central air and heat. I didn't have central air and heat growing up. We heated our house with like a wood burning fireplace, although we did have a bathroom. But so the poverty is so extreme that they don't have television. They don't have you know phones in the old fashioned and the old fashioned way. So technology has not really played a huge part in Native American protests. But with the advent of cell phones, which even in isolated areas they can get and work, um, it gives us a way to connect. So I think in the last 10 years, people now know that we still exist. Whereas I literally, when I would tell people I was Ojibwe or that I was Native American growing up, they would, they would often, often ask, wow, I thought they were all dead like that we don't exist at all. And so the fact that we now have a voice and there are so many um, uh, sites posting all the time about indigenous youth and powwows.com and all these other things and to tribal cultures, that we are at least a presence so that we can connect even from great distances and so that people know we exist. So from the native perspective, I think because of the extreme poverty and distance, it's been a good thing. But I think for the overall like protesting, um, it's just too easy, and I don't think it means the depth of commitment and the depth of the potential to get change as we would hope. And that's my two cents. <laughs> Thank you to all of our speakers today. This was just absolutely amazing. We so enjoyed hearing from all of you. Please go to the Q&A to fill out the form for your attendance credit, if you're here for a class, make sure to click that. And if you're watching this on YouTube, the, the, click, the link should be there as well. And thank you so much. Just a few things. This is our last protest in American history for this semester. But next semester, mark your calendar, we will have three. We will have one um, protest in African American history for Black History Month in February, protest in women's history for Women's History Month in March, and protests in LBGTQ history and kind of modern history as well in April. So we hope that you all are able to come and join us for those. Have a great day and thanks to my co-host, co-producer here, Misty Wilson, who is behind the scenes, who you do not see yet is instrumental in putting all of this on. Thanks again to all of our speakers. I hope you have a great day and have a great Thanksgiving break coming up. Bye everyone. Thank you, Dr. Northrup.